Hello. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Chris Ruoff, the publisher of Charge. Today's webinar is about uh, an introduction to measuring power losses in motors and inverters, and it's brought to you by HPK. After the presentation, there'll be a Q&A session, so click the Q&A button on your screen at any time to submit questions. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, this presentation will be recorded, and a video of the recording will be available to watch on demand after the presentation, and we'll send out an email that contains a link uh, to access that video. And we'll also send out a link uh, to download the slides from the presentation in the follow-up email. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome our speaker, Mitchell Marks from HPK. Welcome, Mitch. Thanks, Chris. Um, and let me just share my screen. And uh, all right, everything look good? Yep, looks great. Cool, we ready to start? Yeah, go for it. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank everybody at Charged. Um, and thank you all for joining. We're here today to talk about measuring power losses in electric motors and inverters. And um, I'm with HBK. HBK is a test and measurement company. Um, we make power analyzers and sensors for characterizing electric motors. Um, so I have, I have a couple of emojis on the screen here. I had a little fun making this presentation. Um, so please pay attention to the emojis as we go through. Uh, we'll have a couple of questions at the end um, where there'll be a chance to win some uh, free seminars or, or some swag from, from HBK. So the, the stuff you're here to care about. Again, HBK makes uh, measurement equipment, software, and sensors. Um, so we really think we have a nice expertise in characterizing losses. Um, so we'll start off with a little introduction. Um, we'll go through inverter losses, um, motor losses, and then talk a little bit about measurement uncertainty and really why you need to have high precision equipment to really trust these types of measurements. Um, cool. So we're probably all pretty familiar with losses in electric machines, but, but I think we've got a pretty wide range of experience here. Um, so I'll just start off basic. Every component in the electric powertrain has a loss of energy between states, some more than others. And these losses are going to create heat. Um, and this heat is going to result in more losses. But losses are also going to decrease our range for a given battery pack. Um, and the, the resultant of this created heat and this decreased range is we're going to increase weight and volume either with larger cooling systems, larger motors and inverters to dissipate the heat, or more batteries, um, which in turn will decrease range. So understanding our losses, characterizing them, minimizing them and mitigating them is really going to help us, you know, minimize our cooling systems, maximize our vehicle range and, and reduce our weight and volume. Um, so that's why this is really relevant, really important. So um, we're going to break it down component by component. So we've got our battery. I'm not going to talk about battery losses. Um, that's, that's kind of its own unique butterfly. Um, but we have the inverter, you know, that making that DC into that AC using, using the switches. We have the electric machine making the AC into torque and speed. Um, and then we have the, the gearbox or transmission output. I'm going to focus on the inverter and the electric machine today, but there's common themes in all four. So coming into the inverter, we have our DC power and the AC output power is going to be that DC power minus conduction losses, minus switching losses and minus stray losses. Um, and, and we'll talk more about each of these, but it's really the resistance of the switch, the turn on, turn off losses, and then the supporting electronics of that, um, of that circuitry. So what am I talking about when I, when I say conduction losses or switching losses? Well, if we look at an inverter switch and you know we've got our, our kind of switch, it's off. And in our off state, if we're measuring differentially, so we're measuring across that switch, we're going to see a voltage. We're going to turn that switch on, and that voltage is going to go to near zero. But these are not perfect components. Um, so there's going to be a time delay in which that voltage goes to zero across the switch, because again, this is differential. And there's going to be a time delay in when that current rises, just the characteristics of that switching pattern. So in this period where we go from open, we close the switch. We're going to have this turn on period where our voltage is falling and our current is rising. And this is going to be our T on. We're going to have this period of time where the voltage is near off, but 
This switch has a resistance. This is our conduction period. This is where there's resistance losses in that switch. And then when we turn that switch back off, when we open up that switch again, we're gonna have that time period, that turn off time where the voltage is then rising and then our current is turning off. And we're gonna have a little bit of energy that gets used in this period. And this is a very exaggerated graph here. Um, but we see we've got a little loss in the turn on time, a little loss in conduction, a little loss in turn off. So these are the things we want to understand and, and characterize. All right, conduction losses. So let's, let's look at this component by component. And I touched on this a little bit, but we'll, we'll just beat it home. Um, the switch has non-resistance. You know, it's a physical conductor. Um, all conductors have resistance. So it's gonna have a power loss. And this power loss is going to be just like anything else, an I squared R. Or if you're measuring differentially, it's gonna be that I drain source times that voltage drain source. Um, and each switch has a resistance. So the number of switches that this current is going through is going to affect what our individual voltage drops are across those switches. And you figure if we have a, a, a really high current going through these switches, that I squared can get pretty large and, and that's a significant amount of loss. Um, we also have to consider that resistance is a function of temperature. As our resistance goes up, our loss is also gonna go up and that heat's gonna go up. So we have to consider that we have to wait, you know, build this cooling system for our inverter as well. We have to understand that when this inverter gets to a certain temperature, we're gonna increase that loss component. Um, and then there's supporting circuitry, um, control boards, and, and um, the switches themselves that do have parasitic losses just to activate them um, as circuitry. So what's the key to measuring this conduction loss period? Well, we're gonna need time-aligned electric and mechanical signals so that we can really understand what that current is as well as that resistance. Um, we're gonna need calculations that, that are possibly executing in the real time um, so that we can do that I squared R in the, in the real time. And then we're gonna, oh, and I keep clicking my little button. We're gonna need the accuracy to, to trust these measurements. Um, and we'll touch on accuracy more towards the end, but the accuracy does become important because we have a very small R, we're squaring that current term and, and we need to have a good intuition and, and a really tight understanding of that current to get that measurement. So that's conduction losses. The next element is switching losses. And these, these are a little more fun. Um, so again, this is that when we turn that switch on, we have that voltage drop time. And again, this is the differential measurement. And then we have that current rise time. And our switching losses can be characterized as the power of the switch is the frequency of switching times the energy it takes to turn on times the energy it takes to turn off. Um, so we really need to understand, you know, what is that on energy? What is that off energy? That can be available in data sheets. A lot of times people will um, experimentally validate them. Now, if we're measuring differentially, again, we're, we're measuring across that switch. Um, it's just gonna be our I drain source times our voltage drain source. And we could do this with, with a high um, sample rate measurement. But what we find is that, um, again, as, as engineers, I'm sure we all struggle with this, um, those losses are going to increase with frequency. So as our frequency increases, that loss component is going to increase. Um, and this could be the switching frequency. And I, I think that's, uh, that's a really important thing to note. Again, when we're weighing out um, what our application is, what our needs are, increasing that switching frequency is going to increase those losses. Um, and they are dependent on that turn off and turn on time. And um, this becomes really relevant when we're choosing our components. Now, how do we measure these? Well, these measurements, especially if you're doing it differentially, do require a, a really high speed measurement. Um, you know, you need to be able to catch that rise time and that fall time. Um, you need a good differential measurement. So you need to be able to, again, that's my switch. You need to be able to measure above and below that switch and get a really precise voltage measurement. And then having recorded data um, that can help you, you know, take this offline and really dig into the details of that switch rise time and that switch fall time if you want to do an analysis. So 
Measuring these is a little different than all the other power measurements we're gonna look at because you need that differential measurement across that switch. Okay, now let's, let's look at an example. Um, so we need to accurately measure our DC input and our AC output to characterize these inverter losses. And, and very frequently we're gonna see, you know, direct voltage measurement of that battery, direct three phase measurements of that inverter for both the voltages and the currents, have those all timeline um, so that you can really precisely look at event input to event output and correlate that to get a very precise efficiency measurement. Um, we're gonna estimate our on resistance and we can do that with a thermocouple and an equation. So if we have a, we know how many switches our, our phase currents are going through. We know the estimated resistance of each of those switches. We can start to calculate the losses based on how much current is going through each of those switches. And then if we have a time aligned temperature, we can really accurately calculate what that resistance is to get a good estimate of our switching losses. Um, or, or that conduction loss. If we wanna look at that turn on, turn off losses, we can characterize that energy on, we can characterize that energy off with a differential measurement and then estimate that with our switching frequency. And, and HBK does offer a scope card with, with up to 250 mega samples per second, where we, we've done a lot of work with characterizing that energy. So let's look at an example. Um, here, just to hit it home, is, is a recorded example of a turn on and turn off losses. So we have that voltage, we have that current, no current because the switch is closed, or excuse me, the switch is open. We turn that switch on, our voltage goes down to zero because we're measuring across that switch. Our current has a little spike and then steadies out at a given current. And we can see we've got that turn on loss, that turn off loss and that conduction loss for the period of time. Now, taking that into practice, um, here's an example of a load step in an electric machine. So we have a three phase voltage. Here's my PWM voltage. I have a three phase current in red. And then I have our power. So I have our um, AC power, input power, and mechanical power in the gray, less gray, and black. And we can see we have a little increase in current. So we're measuring our voltages. We have a transition period. And then we steady out. So we're gonna look at this and how these losses translate. So taking from that last scenario, um, we have the total power loss of the inverter, which this is calculated by, again, P in minus P out. And we can see we're kind of going steady state. We have that transition period and boom, we have that little spike in loss, uh, that little transition period of loss, and then we steady out. And in this example, um, I characterized the conduction losses. I, I, I didn't have the differential measurement on the um, energy. We can see again, that kind of just tracked perfectly. Um, we have that change in torque. We put that load step on, our conduction losses increase, and we can see those stray losses. That's that um, turn on time, turn off time, those kind of trail accordingly. So I think this is kind of interesting that you can actually break that out. And just through simple math, you can say, all right, I've got my P out equals P in minus P conduction and uh, minus P stray. And we can start lumping those things together and understanding those component losses. Okay, that's our inverter. Let's look at our motor now. And now we're looking at the electric machine. So we've got our AC input and our mechanical output. And our mechanical power is our AC power minus our copper losses, minus our iron losses, minus our mechanical losses. And that copper loss has the resistive element. Those iron losses are eddy currents and hysteresis. And then the mechanical loss, that's friction and windage. And fortunately for us, we, we can characterize each of these components. So on the right-hand side, I have a, a circuit diagram um, of an electric machine where we have the phase current going in, we have the resistance of that motor, um, and then we have the, the resistance of the um, rotor in this an induction machine. And again, and really simply, our, our copper losses are I squared R, so our phase current squared times the resistance of our windings. And this is gonna be 
the majority of the power losses we see in this machine um, typically. And this is where the temperature dependence becomes extremely important because that winding resistance is equal to a base resistance times the temperature dependence. And uh, fortunately for us, resistance is pretty linear. And we find that as that temperature increases, our resistance increases. And we get this kind of circular effect of as my resistance increases, more losses, more losses, more heat. But these can be reduced by cooling. So this really is important for the, the sizing of our cooling system. So to characterize these losses, it's, it's not a complex equation. We're going to characterize it with phase currents and, and temperatures. And very often we see that um, people testing their machines will have, you know, two, three, 16, 32 thermocouples spread throughout the machine. And using these thermocouples, um, we can get a measurement of the rotor winding. We can feed that into our resistance equation. And we can understand what that resistance is very precisely. So this is cool. Um, because if you have a machine or you have an acquisition system where you can bring in um, thermocouples, you can correlate a thermocouple to a resistance with just a linear curve. You could have a polynomial based on testing where you actually measure points and correlate that to a resistance and get a very accurate measurement on what your winding resistance is going to be. So you can do that experimentally. You can do that with, uh, with a linear equation. Um, and this allows you to very accurately characterize your resistance and therefore very accurately ca characterize your copper losses. So when we're measuring the power losses, we need a really good time alignment between that current and that resistance. And you might say resistance is slow, um, that's true, but you still wanna have that time alignment. If you get a big phase shift, you're gonna start losing accuracy in that measurement. You really want custom sensors and equations. So when I say custom sensors, I mean the ability to take a measurement like temperature and correlate it to resistance. You wanna be able to make a sensor where you can input a curve or you can input a lookup table. Um, and having that is gonna give you the ability to really understand and have a good intuition for your power losses from copper in the real time, like a scope trace in front of you. And then again, accuracy. Accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. We're squaring a term. Every time you square a term, that accuracy becomes really important. So that's copper losses. Um, and, and measuring those is, is, is really, there's a lot to it because you need to have that good resistance because you need to have that accurate measurement. And then you can throw in things you can re really fancy and do things like skin effect losses. Um, so skin effect is a pretty cool phenomena where the AC frequency makes a conductor look smaller. Um, again, back to my emojis, there's really hard to find one for smaller, so you get a shrimp. Um, but what does that mean? So the given conductor has a size. And at a given frequency, um, this conductor is either going to look like a full conductor or it's going to look smaller. So in my example here, um, we have the frequency of operation. We have the skin depth, which is how far into the conductor we go before that you can actually use for passing current and then a graphical representation. So blue is able to pass current. We have a 50 Hertz signal. Our skin depth is 9.38 millimeters. And, and you know, if this is a 10 millimeter um, conductor, we can use all the blue part. We go to 500 Hertz, which we're still in the range of machine operation. Our skin depth is two point or basically three millimeters. All right, now we can't use as much of that conductor. This red part of the conductor is not usable. Our resistance goes up. We go to five kilohertz, we start operating at those really high frequencies, our resistance goes way up and all of this white space is no longer usable. So we're seeing that resistance increase. And then we go to the switching frequencies and, and we see quite a bit of skin effect. Now we have a very, very small effective conductor. We have 0.3 millimeters that are, that are usable. So this is to say that when we operate at higher frequencies, we have higher losses because of the size of our conductor. Now these are design constraints, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put in Litz wire or something like that. But the AC resistance is gonna be the DC resistance times uh, the gauge factor times a frequency. Pretty much what this tells us is that if we wanna measure this, 
if we care about these high frequencies, our fundamentals are high enough, our switching frequencies are high enough, we can take these into effect in our resistance equation. And then we can use that for the copper loss equation. So if skin depth is a concern, if you want to look at that, you can use maybe this equation, or, or if you have a better equation, go for it, to implement this into your resistance equation. So you can make that resistance curve even more complex or, or more accurate. Um, but again, when we're doing these measurements, custom equations, sometimes custom sensors, because we want to take that resistance or that frequency measurement and understand how that affects our skin effect. Um, and then again, the accuracy of the measurement. So if you have custom equations, you can start to implement things like getting that AC resistance. If you have custom sensors, you can start implementing things like getting that linear curve for your resistance based on things like frequency. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff, um, but there, there's more to it than, than just kind of the physics. All right, iron losses. Um, iron losses are, are pretty fascinating to me. Um, this will by no means be a dissertation because it's, it's a very complex thing, but, but the basic overview is that when we have an AC wave, so this is my current waveform down at the bottom here, and my colors match up. Magnetizing the iron, so turning the stator into a magnet, requires energy. And losses are going to happen every sine wave. And they're a function of, of the properties of the iron, so the permeability of the iron and the resistance of the iron. And what we get is if we get the magnetization of the motor, so this is the magnetization of the iron, when our sine wave is increasing, we see this energy being used to magnetize that stator iron. Then as our sine wave is waning, we see that energy loss while we're demagnetizing that stator iron. Negative direction back to zero. So really it's kind of the, the, um, the area of this curve is, is really kind of the loss we're seeing due to turning the iron into a magnet and off a magnet. Now, this equation is, is wild. Um, we have a couple of material properties. We have the Steinmetz um, exponent, the Steinmetz coefficient. We have the volume of the um, conductor, so the volume of the iron. We have the frequency of operation. That's, that's the fundamental frequency. Um, and then we have the flux. And I, I'll be straight with you. This, this is a difficult thing to measure, but if you really care about these properties, you can start to attempt to measure this in order to understand what those different elements are. So you can calculate flux density by getting the DQ um, currents and the DQ voltages and calculating flux. You can measure the frequency, and then you will need to supply your volume, your exponents. But if you have the data, if you have the measured data, if you have the flux values, you can start to understand what your variables are and fine tune those variables that you might get from your supplier. So if you have the data, you can go to post-process and do a sensitivity analysis. Once you trust those values, you can plug them back into here and look at them live. You know, if we look at this equation, um, there's an exponent here. So accuracy again is gonna be key um, to really understanding what this power loss from hysteresis is. You can also implement custom equations. Once you have those values, you can view them in the real time. Um, and because we're doing flux equations and we need the rotor position, the time alignment of electric and mechanical values is gonna be, become really important. So while this is difficult, it can be done and you can start to understand your material properties. So you can potentially go back to your suppliers and say, hey, this is not what you promised. I need to lower my iron losses. So that's hysteresis losses. Eddy currents. Um, this is one of my favorites. Faraday's law states that any change in the environment of a coil of wire will cause a voltage to be induced in the coil, regardless of how the magnetic change is produced. <laughs> Pretty much what that says is that if we're putting magnetic flux through a lamination or through a chunk of iron, it's going to induce its own currents <laughs> because it's a conductor itself. So the magnetism is flux is going to self-induce a voltage. 
And since that conductor has a resistance, current will flow in the core and create losses. How do we combat this? Well, rather than having one big chunk of iron, we can start segmenting our core and our stator and our rotor for that matter into small segments. So we can, we can chunk those laminations into pieces and the smaller those laminations get, the higher their resistance gets, and we decrease those losses. So basically by making those laminations smaller and smaller, we make them have a higher resistance, lower losses. Now we're decreasing losses, but we're also decreasing the active material. Um, we'll save that for another day. So the energy that we're losing from eddy currents um, is again, another real beast of an equation where we have squares and we have the frequency squared, the flux squared, the thickness, the volume. Um, but the same as, as with, the, with the hysteresis losses, um, we can start to perform sensitivity analysis on these variables. You know, we can characterize that KE. Um, thickness is a pretty straightforward thing. Volume is pretty straightforward. Um, so we can start to do sensitivity analysis. We've got those squares. So accuracy, again, having a really precise measurement on your flux is going to affect that output. Um, and having custom equations allows you to do this. So if you can record that data, you can do that sensitivity analysis, you can get a really good intuition for what those eddy current losses are and start to compare that to your models, see how close those things correlate. Lastly, um, the mechanical losses, this is, this is kind of the, the fun one. Um, you've got the internal windage of the machine, the actual kind of air resistance of it rotating. Um, and internal windage is, is kind of a exponential curve. The faster you spin, the, the higher your losses. But you can characterize that curve at a no load measurement, get a, get a curve for it, implement that via um, you know, a custom sensor. So you can characterize that, get the curve, character, uh, uh, implement it. Bearing friction. Um, bearings all have different curves. But again, if you have the curve, it's a function of speed. Your loss is a function of speed. If you know the speed, you can get the bearing loss. Um, and again, you can implement a curve for that. And then there's things like misalignment, which get a little more tricky. I won't, I won't touch on those. I, I think that would be very hard to characterize. Um, but the keys to measurement are again, having a really accurate speed measurement, having a really accurate torque measurement, and then um, having you know, the ability to implement custom sensors to, to look at what those components are. Um, there is an element of dynamic loss, and this is one that's a, a little more unique, um, that if you're changing load states, you're gonna have additional losses when you're changing speeds. Um, and this is largely because the magnet magnetization currents that we see when we're changing states. Uh, so in my example on the right-hand side, uh, we have a machine that was not in operation, and then um, we started. And you can see that my current sine wave happens, and if I look at my power and my reactive power and my apparent power, we get this big value compared to the steady state operation. So we get this kind of big inrush, this additional loss. Um, and what we're going to see this is in circumstances like when we're starting and stopping the motor. So if we're starting and ramping up that machine, we're gonna see additional losses that we might not see in steady state operation. So if we're looking at a drive cycle of a motor, if we're looking at the operation through the full range, we might wanna understand our losses in dynamic scenarios. This is where um, HBK offers a thing called cycle detect where we can actually look at the power cycle to cycle. We look at the copper losses, the winding losses, cycle to cycle, um, electrical cycle to really dynamically characterize what those motor losses are. So the key to measurements, a, a real-time cycle um, detection for measuring power, and then time alignment between the electric and mechanical signals so we can understand what our torque and speed are and what our um, electrical power is so that we can really look at what that loss is um, across the machine and get that differential. Okay, measuring motor loss. Um, we want to accurately measure that AC input, so that voltage and current, but also really accurately measure our torque and speed. So here, this is where you would use a, a torque sensor and an encoder um, or, or a resolver. You want to use some thermocouples to characterize um, your copper, your resistances, and, and get your 
copper losses and iron losses. And to be honest with you, most of the time when people are getting their iron losses, the iron losses equals, you know, P mech minus P um, copper minus P uh, friction and windage. Um, so, you know, there, we're, we're uh, the, the hysteresis and eddy currents are difficult to measure. We have people attempting to do it, um, doing a really nice job of it. But um, a lot of people are just taking their iron losses as their total losses minus their copper losses minus their friction and windage. Um, but we're gonna measure that mechanical loss with an equation or, or a curve based on measurement. So basically measure output, measure input, and get the in-between steps with our um, thermocouples with our, with our curves. Which brings us to measurement uncertainty. I think every one of the points I touched on accuracy, accuracy in mechanical measurement, accuracy of the electrical measurements, accuracy of the voltage and current measurements. And here's why. Um, we're gonna have electrical energy going into something like an inverter. And we're gonna have um, electric energy coming out. And we're gonna have that loss component in the middle. I think that's kind of been the, the theme of this whole presentation. Um, so let's take our example and let's say we have a 500 kilowatt inverter. And that 500 kilowatt inverter has a 95% efficiency. And, and this is like fact, this is known. Just this is truth for our example's sake. So let's look at a measurement chain of 1% error. Our input's 500 kilowatts. And this 500 kilowatts has a 1% measurement uncertainty. This is the whole measurement chain. So this is 500 plus or minus five. That's a 1% error. Output, 475. So we have 475 plus or minus 4.75 because we have that 1% uncertainty. Well, our whole loss component is gonna be 25 kilowatts plus or minus 9.75 kilowatts. This is effectively a 39% uncertainty or a 39% error. Um, that's huge. And then let's make that specific. Let's say we're looking at just the conduction losses that I squared R of five kilowatts. Five kilowatts plus or minus 9.75 is, you know, I don't even know how to calculate that. Um, this was the inspiration for the emojis today, by the way. Um, now let's say we have a 0.1% error. 500 kilowatts plus or minus 0.5 kilowatts. 475 plus or minus 0.475. Well, now that 25 kilowatt loss, 0.975 because we need to add those uncertainties. I don't think I made that clear over here. We need to add those uncertainties in a differential scenario. That's 3.9%. It's not great, but it's not bad. Like we're that loss component, we're pretty confident in that. And now we start to look at like that five kilowatts of conduction loss plus or minus 0.975. Yeah, that's a 20% error, but that's in the realm of you know, we can start to really trust this and we can start to use this for comparing to our models. We can start to use this to look at the difference between, um, you know, iron losses and copper losses with some confidence and, and use that to validate our engineering choices. So if you wanna achieve a reasonable measurement for values like power loss, you really need the most accurate measurement equipment you can get at, for mechanical measurements, for electrical measurements. Um, and I'm not going to preach to you today about why we're so great at this at HBK, um, but if you'd like to take that offline, we, we'd be happy to explain why. Um, and just really hitting home that uncertainty point, you know, let's say our uncertainty band is, is this little pink icon. Well, if we have our total loss, our mechanical loss, our inverter, our copper, and these are not perfect depictions. Uh, this was me in Excel making a point. Um, you have this plus or minus band. That's our uncertainty. And when we start getting down to things like eddy currents or friction or hysteresis, we have to ask ourselves, is my equipment accurate enough to trust these measurements? And, and this is where the challenge comes is, is we do have to look at our uncertainty and say, which of these values can I trust and how much of that can I trust? So by make, getting more accurate measurement equipment, 
by really looking at what your variables are, by really looking at what your uncertainty is for a given operation point for a given frequency, if you can start to minimize those losses or minimize that uncertainty, you can have more confidence in what you're measuring. Now, let's, let's look back at that real example again, um, where we have that you know, voltage, that current, and that load step. We see our power, um, AC power, input power, mechanical power. Well, for this given measurement of a certain number of kilowatts, um, you know, we have a plus or minus three watt DC error. And I, I think this is like a seven and a half kilowatt measurement. And we have a plus or minus three and a half watt AC error. And this is based on the, the HBM measurements. Um, this gives us a plus or minus 6.4 watt differential. On a seven kilowatt signal, that's pretty good. I think we can live with that. Um, and this is where that ability to trust those losses comes in is that we're, we're with a high enough accuracy on your output power, you can really start to dig into the details and really start to dig into things like copper losses or conduction losses. And if we look at the losses of our motor, you know, the total losses of our motor, where we're looking at that total motor loss in black, where we have that 6.4 kilowatts or 6.4 watts of loss on a total of 600 watts, um, that's pretty good. I mean, that's pretty good. That's that's a very negligible percentage. And then we start looking at copper losses, and we can see that okay, our copper losses that's a pretty trustworthy measurement as well. Our iron losses, uh, in this example, I kind of doubt it. Um, I don't get the best data in the world because you guys all have NDAs and whatnot, and I respect that. Um, so sometimes I get the bad data sets where not many of these were thermally compensated correctly, um, which is why when we see that load step, we kind of see a lot of stray losses. Well, I had one thermocouple on my copper losses. Um, so I didn't really have a good idea of my resistance, especially in that transient period. So when we have that inrush current, when we have all of that, that's where the stray is going. This is inrush losses. Um, and my thermocouple is just not really picking it up. Or my iron losses, yeah, they don't have the best equation. That transient period is not really picking it up. So we're, we are as good as our variables, we are as good as our equations, but we can really get to a point where we trust things like copper losses, where we trust things like iron losses being the summation of all these things. Um, and the accuracy of our measurement is gonna give us the ability to trust these values. So this is really cool. Um, and this uncertainty and having a good uncertainty band is going to give you the ability to say, all right, this copper loss is you know plus or minus 1%. I can live with that. So I'll close out with, with why HBK and when why our E-Drive system is particularly good at this um, type of power loss measurement. We have a simple data collection of electromechanical signals. So we can bring in your thermocouples. We can bring in your torques, your speeds, your voltages, your currents, all in one time aligned place. So that when you do your calculations for loss, no matter what it is, if you've got your own secret sauce or you're using the generic equations, we can make that measurement with a lot of confidence, with a lot of accuracy because of that time alignment, and our equations aren't getting skewed. We have fast and accurate power measurements. So we use that cycle detect so we can start to understand um, you know, those inrush currents. We can start to understand those dynamic losses. So we have the lowest possible measurement uncertainty and that's across the frequency range. The cycle detect uh, algorithm allows us to measure frequencies, really the high fundamental frequencies extremely well. So if you're going up, you're getting into that iron loss range, um, we can do a very good job at characterizing that. And we have an extremely good torque measurement uncertainty when you start coupling an HBK torque sensor with an E-Drive system, we are really industry leading at torque accuracy. Um, love to talk to anybody about that further. We offer custom equations. Um, each of our cards has a digital signal processor on board where you can program in all of your own equations, all of your own um, sensors, 
So you can start to understand those curves based on speed and do that in the real time. We record all of our data um, so that if you wanna go into post-process and you wanna refine your models or you wanna do a sensitivity analysis, you can do that with one piece of test equipment. And we have local support and trainings um, in really any market. Uh, so if you want to learn more, you want to go more in depth, um, or you just want to get these types of things implemented and set up, we would be happy to help you. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for your time. We covered a lot of ground. I'm sure there's plenty of questions. Um, so please feel free to scan this and reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, ask your questions in the chat box, which I think, oh no, for you guys, it'll be down here, somewhere down here. Um, and while we wait for some questions to roll in, if you enter into the question box, how many emojis we are, we had in this presentation, or if you can name how many different emojis were in this presentation, um, the closest people I will reach out to and offer a free seminar on site. So uh, if you can tell us how many emojis there were or how many different emojis there were, um, we'll, we'll get you a free training. So with that, um, Klaus, I think you were gonna read some of the questions off. Oh, Klaus there. All right. Yeah, I am. I am, sorry, <laughs> cool. sorry I yep. was muted. Yeah, at the moment they come in pretty quickly. Uh, okay. I answered a few. Okay. Uh, well, but here is one. You need to go to page 22 of okay. the presentation. Okay. Does the introduced loss measurement device give the losses data with the temperature estimation? Ah, so having, having the uncertainty of the temperature will definitely play into um, the uncertainty of the measurement. Um, that one, I, I, that one, we have a guy who is an expert in measurement uncertainty. Um, he would love to help you solve that equation. I, I can't say I know the, the ins and outs of it, um, but the more accurate you can have that resistance measurement and, and you can do a really good job of getting an accurate resistance measurement, um, the more accurate that loss calculation is gonna be. So if we look at the copper losses, for example, um, you know this might have a, a bigger band because it's temperature dependent, um, but you can get a very accurate measurement on current you're squaring that inaccuracy and then you count in for the inaccuracy of the resistance, um, you can still get a measurement that you have a high level of confidence in. I, Klaus, do you think I answered the question there? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> Here's a question about probe installation. Uh, I would be interested to know how HPK is installing the different probes to take such measurements. Ah. Measurement would be influenced just by the way a clamp or a probe is installed. Yeah, um, absolutely. So current sensors, uh, I guess we'll start with the voltage. Um, so on voltages, if we've got our cards here, um, we'll measure up to 1.5 kilovolts directly into our measurement system. Um, and that will cut out inaccuracy in that voltage measurement chain. Um, so that's, that's kind of the first step of this question is, all right, you bring in the voltages and you have the lowest um, level of uncertainty in your measurement equipment. Next is where you place the measurement. Um, if you want to measure somewhere, you do need to account for that um, resistance of the line. So if you have a inverter that's a mile away from your motor, uh, it, the resistance of that transmission line absolutely needs to be accounted for. Um, so you need to choose where you make the measurement. So if you wanna characterize the losses of the machine, you need to measure right next to the machine. If you wanna characterize the losses of the inverter, you need to measure right next to the inverter. Um, and we do have a handful of customers doing um, some really interesting things where they have hundreds of meters of, of power line um, where they actually characterize the losses of that, um, of that transmission line between the motor and the inverter. This will be case to case naturally, um, because some of you might have three millimeters of distance between your inverter and your motor, and it's more or less relevant. If you have 100 yards or 100 miles, 
um, that becomes much more relevant. Things like measuring current correctly um, is another interesting topic. Uh, I actually have a nice YouTube video on that. Um, but how the conductor goes through the, um, the clamp or, or the, the flux gate transducer um, will also affect the measurement. So these are all things that can go into your uncertainty equation if you really want to get into the weeds. Again, um, we're actually gonna have a follow-up webinar on measurement uncertainty um, that I really hope you all can join or we have a, an expert on staff who um, will be happy to dig through the details with you. And Klaus, you're, you're kind of an expert in that area as well. Did I, did I cover it pretty well? Yeah, 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 but but I'm I'm busy more going through the other questions, <laughs> okay. so I could not follow your answer because they are coming in pretty uh, pretty frequently now. We no we problem. will not be able to answer them uh, in in real time, okay. but for those which we cannot answer, we will we will send out follow up emails. Here's another one: uh, many loss calculations are dependent on resistance. Where mm -hmm. does this measurement come from? Yeah, um, so the resistance of, of the measurement um, is going to be estimated, basically. So if you can measure the temperature of your windings, but I, I'll, I'll speak to the winding, for example, but this applies for the switches as well. Um, and I don't have a good picture. Um, if you can estimate the resistance of your windings, so let's say I've got my coil of wire and I have a thermocouple. If I can measure my temperature of my winding, we can figure out what our, um, you know, or oop, excuse me, temp resistance. We can figure out what our resistance is as we increase or decrease temperature. So we get that thermocouple measurement, we estimate the resistance of the winding and we can linearize it. Um, you could also do this experimentally where for example, and I'll, I'll switch colors so I'm not crowding everything. Let's say I measure at 20 degrees, I measure at 30 degrees, I measure at 50 degrees, and I get a curve like this. This is very not representative of real life. You could implement this curve based on experimental temperature versus resistance measurements and implement that into, um, into a sensor in the sensor database uh, that we offer and linearize um, resistance that way. So it would be, the short answer is you can measure resistance from temperature. Okay, here's another one. How is about proper detection of current components up to the kilohertz range? And how does this range affect the losses measurement? Yeah, um, so in the inverter driven machine, um, we're naturally going to have high frequencies, you know, 10 kilohertz, 50 kilohertz, and, and we're even seeing up to the 100 kilohertz range. Um, if we come back to kind of the, uh, sorry for jumping around, I thought I had a slide near me. Um, if we kind of come down to the current sensors, uh, we really need to look at the bandwidth of those current sensors. You know, for example, the HBK current sensors, um, have anywhere based on the range from a 200 to a um, 500 kilohertz bandwidth. I think we might even have one that's got a megahertz bandwidth. So, okay, we can eliminate that element. Then we come down to the measurement of the individual loss components. Um, and this is where you can lump it in and say, you know, all my iron losses are just a differential. Um, or you can start to look at, okay, what is the energy of my turn on time? What is the energy of my turn off time? And how many times am I having that per second? And start to mathematically characterize it that way. Um, so it really comes down to each of the individual components. We can handle the frequency on a case-to-case -case basis based on which loss component you're looking at. Um, but having the accuracy in the sensors to accurately measure that, um, that value, having the bandwidth and accuracy in the um, measurement equipment to characterize those frequencies, um, you can start implementing the individual loss components. Okay, so let's get a little bit more challenging, Mitch. Okay. <laughs> Here's a question which did come in pretty early. 
and I was not able to answer it. So I promised to put it on the real expert. <laughs> uh, assuming my inverter PWM is established by carrier based PWM. Okay. Uh, are there any problems to overmodulate my modulation signal in order to reduce my switching losses? Oh, you really meant that. Um, I, I think I'm going to have to take, I'm going to have to process that one a little bit and take it offline. Um, that's what little... I said. That's what I said, Mitch. I said, <laughs> potentially Mitch can also not answer it on spot and we might need to come, come yeah. back to you. So I, yeah, I think that gets a little more into the motor controller rather than the measurement. Um, but I, I'd be happy to give it a thought and uh, get back to you. Good, good question. <laughs> Uh, another one actually, which, which did come in multiple times. What is the advantage of doing all these tests with a single piece of equipment? Yeah, um, the, the time alignment of the signals is really the key. Uh, because if you have your temperature, your voltage, your current, your torque, your speed, all in alignment, you know, the temperature moves slow, resistance moves slow, relative to the inverter torque moves slow. But the more you start having phase shifts between those measurements, the more variables you introduce, the wider you have to make this uncertainty band. So if, if you have potentially a second of delay between your temperature and your, um, or between your resistance and your AC power, that's big. You know, that, that's potentially gonna be a phase shift in your measurement and you're going to get nonsense results. Um, if your torque and speed are misaligned, um, again, the, the same issue. When you look at efficiency and you take that differential that I, I drew all over here, um, this value starts increasing and it starts creeping up because now you have alignment issues as well as uncertainty issues. So that's the big advantage to having everything in one place outside of simplifying your measurements, simplifying your data sets, making your life easier and set up. Just looking at the data, it's, it's alignment issues. Okay, here's a question about connectors and whether we can make, let's say a general remark with the, the Connector resistance should also be treated as a potential source of loss or whether this is typically neglectable. Ooh, um, I think I might know who actually asked that question. Uh, no, it's, it's not negligible. Um, funny story, my first job, I actually worked in looking at um, connectors and how crimps can fail. Uh, and trust me, crimps can fail and get very hot. Um, no, no, no. The, the connection resistance um, is definitely a piece that needs to be understood. Um, if you really want to dig into the details, this is much along the transmission line losses. Um, yeah, if you really want to start breaking down your loss components, looking at your cabling, um, looking at the, the loss of the connections is going to be relevant. A lot of times we might just lump that into stray losses or we might just lump that into copper losses or inverter losses, um, but that can't always be the case. If you wanna do a really in-depth analysis, um, looking at what type of connector you use, whether it's a crimp, um, whether it's a bolt, um, whether it's a, a, a bus bars that, that slide into place, um, understanding those connections will, will be relevant. And um, if you can improve you know, your, your crimp quality, um, you can absolutely improve your losses no matter how small they are. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, when you look at the PMAC motor, so mm -hmm. yeah, PMAC motor, the current is a low frequency sine wave and the voltage is a high frequency square wave. Mm -hmm. In order to calculate the eddy current losses, which frequency applies, voltage or current? Yes. Um, I, I think the one that we're probably most concerned with is the fundamental frequency, the current frequency, um, because that's what's inducing, um, that's what's creating the, the magnetism, and that magnetism is then self-inducing that, that voltage. Um, so it's a little bit of cat and mouse there, uh, because you could say, well, my current has a high frequency element to it, 
Uh, but the predominant one of interest is going to be that, that fundamental frequency, especially when you start getting into the higher frequency range. Uh, but the switching is not to be neglected um, and, and will absolutely result in some. Um, but the fundamental, I believe, is, is the predominant loss bringer. Okay, well, I think we can probably put a last one on right. spot before Give me we... a softball clause. Uh, well, we yeah, there there are two easy ones, Mitch. Now the, these these I will these I will answer. Um, do you put any sensor to measure flux density on the iron core to calculate iron losses? Um, I've seen it done. Um, I'm not aware of any because I think you typically do this with more of like a photo paper. Um, if if you have a sensor in mind, I would love to see it. Um, or, or send me a link to it, um, please. Uh, it would definitely be reasonable if, if you had such a, such a flux sensor to bring that into the data set. Um, a lot of times, you know, with things I've seen, I find them challenging to kind of trust or characterize the whole cores core with. Um, the way we typically do flux is by measuring um, the voltages and currents and then, and then calculating the flux which I think if I am remembering correct, um, flux is equal to uh, in the steady state, um, I think it's V minus IR over omega. I might, I might be off on that a little bit. Um, but if you have the voltage, you have the current, you have the, the losses uh, in, the, in the winding and you have the speed of the motor, you can start to calculate your flux. Um, so again, this comes down to time alignment because now we have voltage, current, speed, resistance. So we have uh, three different elements um, all coming into play. Okay, I think I need to hand back to Charge TVs because we reached the, the end of our time slot. Excellent. This is remaining, Charge. Yeah, remaining open questions will be answered by, by, by email. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll send a report over to you guys so you can uh, see uh, which questions were asked and um, and then we can follow up. Additionally, we'll be sending out, uh, as I said earlier, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with uh, links to download the slides for the presentation and also a link to um, to watch a recorded video on demand. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and thanks uh, Mitch and Klaus for the great presentation and interactive uh, Q&A. We had uh, lots of great questions, lots of uh, participants. Uh, so thanks everyone. Have a good day. Cheers, thank you.